all right good afternoon everybody welcome to this uh, series of uh, talks by uh, department of botany and today with us a very este esteemed chief guest professor gautam menon uh, he is a professor at ashoka university and before introducing him we at uh, department of botany is in, you know we are arranging this uh, uh, webinar series every month we are planning to have one webinar and this is our second webinar as you remember the last uh, month we organized a webinar with the dst secretary so this time we have a very fantastic and uh, luminary talk, uh, talk by professor gautam menon distinguished professor at ashoka university to introduce him we have with us uh, sheetal singh sheetal is a first year msc botany student from delhi over to you sheetal please introduce our uh, you know the speaker Good evening, everyone. Present here, I feel immense pl pleasure welcoming Gautam Menon. He is a professor of physics and biology at Ash Ashoka University, Sonipat. He holds a PhD in physics in physics uh, uh, from uh, IISC Bangalore. He worked at the Tata Institute of Mumbai. He uh, uh, Mumbai. He, he entered at Seaman Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada before returning to India to join the Institute of Mathematical Sciences in Chennai, where he spent 20 years before joining Ashoka University. He spent a year and half, half as a visiting professor at the National University of Singapore between 2011 and 2013. He currently leads several collaboration and aimed at the mathematical and computational modeling of COVID-19 in India, including the IN, INDSCI SIM project and Bharat SIM. He has appeared on national and international TV channels, including the BBC, and has been quoted in press many times since the beginning of the pandemic. Apart from his scientific work, he is interested to in making science more and more interesting and accessible to common public and in particular enjoy teaching. He has been involved in science popularization for many years, including starting the very popular end science at the Sabha series of scientific talks for the general public at the, at the Music Academy in China. Over to you, sir. Yeah, it's Music <laughs> Academy in Chennai. And yeah, I'm also very interested, uh, Professor Menon, uh, how a Music Academy is uh, interested to have this kind of science talk series. Um, uh, you know, uh, my request is please enlighten perhaps towards the end of your talk. It's very interesting combination to have the Chennai, very famous academy. I, 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 was also, I also did my master's in, in Chennai, Madras University. And Chennai Musical Academy, uh, if I remember it right, established in way back in 1800s, uh, Britishers' time. And yeah, it, it, they're also into the science popularization, and you're involved with that too. And before you, uh, you begin your talk, yes, uh, uh, Professor Menon is uh, quite internationally reputed. And it was only yesterday that uh, news came in BBC which uh, you know which uh, asked uh, professor menon's opinion about the latest spread of the, the covid 19 is it the second wave or uh, or not so the, the link i'm going to share with the students so yeah over to you sir thank you mishital singh and thank you professor felix for this very kind introduction i will tell you now a little bit about ideas concerning modeling of disease so let me share my screen first and then we can Proceed. So you can, you'll have to tell me if my screen is visible and you can hear me clearly. Is that okay? All is well, sir. Go ahead. All is well. Very good. I want to tell you a little bit about how scientists think about modeling disease spread, but I want to keep it simple. So I just want to explain what these ideas are without introducing complicated mathematics, because I think that much of the subject is actually very intuitive and easy to learn. This is a picture from the welcome collection of plague patients in Bombay towards the turn of the century. So the doctors that you can see at the back, the British doctor, the patients I think are Indian patients. So I want to start with an example of why it's important to understand pandemics of infectious diseases. And my example is not going to be COVID-19. It's going to be a different example because I think that this might interest you and you might actually find it fun. Here's the headline. So this is from the CNN International new service from their website, which says two MERS patients die in South Korea. So the date on this is June 2nd, 2015. 
MERS is expands to Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. That's why it's called MERS. And now the question is, why is it that one of the largest news agencies in the world is making a special case or highlighting the fact that two patients oh, yeah. died in South Korea? What is it that makes it special? Why, why is it even bothering to say something like this? We actually know a lot more about this patient, this particular patient who started off the disease that, that, that is represented on the CNN page. We know that this patient who began all of this was a South Korean who had, was working in the Middle East. So he traveled widely in the Middle East. And this is an example of his travel. He went from, so it's number one, he started in Bahrain, went to the UAE, came back to Bahrain, went to Saudi Arabia, came back to Bahrain, flew from there to Qatar, and flew from then, this is his last stop is South Korea. And he reached South Korea by the 4th of May, 2015, and he fell ill by the 11th of May, 2015. We know a lot about this person. So here's an example of, of him. So that's a red person that you can see right in the center of that circle. All of the people who he managed to infect with the disease called MERS, so some of them happened to be fellow patients who were there in the same ward as he. Four of them were hospital staff who provided care for him. A bunch of them were visitors who came to visit other people in the ward. His wife was another person he managed to infect. One of the people in the, one of the visitors then moved to China and infected somebody else in China. Whereas some of the other patients who, when they recovered, went out and infected other people, caused secondary cases in South Korea. So you can see that this is very unusual to be able to track everybody that this person interacted with. And you can ask, for example, why is it that CNN is not highlighting uh, something like this? Two TB patients die in South Korea. So why wasn't something like this reported? Why does it say two MERS patients died in South Korea? And just to remind you what the numbers are like, around 1,000 TB patients die every day in India. So that's why why this number two is so, so small compared to that number 1,000. Why was so much trouble taken to track down every contact of the, persons, of, the, of the person who had initially fallen ill? And why are diseases like MERS special? If you understand that, you'll understand a little bit about why we think of infectious diseases and why we, under, why we recognize the importance of knowing the epidemiology of, it, of infectious diseases and why it's so important to be able to control them. So the reason is here, it's because the disease MERS is untreatable. There is no vaccine for it. There is no medicine for it. It's often a fatal disease. So about 30% of people who contract the disease will die of the disease. And patients often die within a matter of days of contracting the disease. MERS can be transmitted from person to person. So the person who came back from the Middle East to the hospital in South Korea managed to transmit to a whole bunch of people around him. So it can be transmitted from person to person. Therefore, it's an infectious disease, and that's important, with the potential of traveling across the world. So it's pandemic. It started out in South Korea, he fell ill in, in, in South Korea. In, in, it started off in Saudi Arabia, he fell ill in South Korea. But the patients he managed to infect, one of them happened to go to China, as well as other parts of South Korea. So an infectious disease with pandemic potential that can spread about the world is particularly important for us. MERS is a disease which originated in Saudi Arabia. It also has the most cases. So that's a plot of the cases all the way from 2012 to 2018. It's still there in the background. There's always a steady background of cases that one can see. So MERS originated in Saudi Arabia, which has the most cases. You can see the little red spike. And that's the South Korean cases that originated in this gentleman who was traveling back to South Korea. Why is it worrying to consider this disease? And why is it important to think about it? The reason is that Saudi Arabia sees among the largest annual gatherings of people, they number in the millions, which is a Hajj gathering. And after they come to Saudi Arabia, to Mecca and Medina, they return to their countries, around 190, 195 of these countries from which they originated. So it's very important to ensure that they don't carry back MERS with them, that they don't take the disease back, or to their 195, 2000 countries. That's particularly important when we think about the potential of the disease to move between person and person. So there are similar worries for all large gatherings. The fact that epidemics can spread through contact between people, through person-to-person -person contact. And this is an example of our own very large gatherings, the Kumbh Mela. And you can know now that there are fairly stringent rules being applied to the Kumbh Mela so that people do not, are not able to transfer the disease from one to the other. That's the real reason why we should be aware of the importance of the spread of pandemic diseases. Felix, there's a bit of feedback from other sound. Can we just switch that off? And, uh, yeah. 
So let's yeah, make... yeah, some background noise. Yeah, exactly. I, I just muted them. Yeah, go okay. ahead, please. All right. So let's understand the difference between a disease outbreak, which is when a disease occurs in, in somewhat larger number than you might normally expect in a community or region. So even if you have 10 or 20 cases of Ebola, that is an outbreak of Ebola, even though it doesn't seem as large as, as, as sort of typical numbers that you might see for COVID-19. A dep- epidemic is when an outbreak spreads over across a local geographic region. For example, an epidemic could be spread across parts of India. And it's certainly not confined anymore to a localized local region of an outbreak. A pandemic is when an epidemic becomes global, when it spans many countries. And right now, HIV AIDS is one example of a pandemic. The other example is the COVID-19 pandemic, which has now spread across the world. About 220 countries across the world have reported cases of COVID-19. So then the spread of the disease is not restricted to a local region. It's not restricted to a country or even a local geographical region like South Africa, such as South Asia, but it has now spread much beyond that. let me tell you a little bit about the history of diseases. And this, within the last 110 years, the Spanish flu pandemic is certainly the largest public health event that ever happened to us until COVID came along. And Spanish flu spread across the world between about January of 1918 and December of about 1919. It also came in multiple waves. And it infected roughly 500 million people across the world. That's as best as we can estimate. That's about 25% of the world's population. Of the people who were infected with Spanish flu, around 30 to 50 million people died of it. And in India, India was particularly badly struck. In fact, it had saw larger numbers of deaths than virtually any other country. Around 15 to 20 million people actually died. And that time, this was about 5 to 10 percent of the Indian population at that time, around 1918, 1919. So you should think of this of, of this history as really stretching from Spanish from the original Spanish flu in 1918, 1919, to just what happened in the century with SARS between 2002, 2003, H1N1 with 2009, MERS pretty much ongoing since 2012, Ebola, which periodically rises and is suppressed, which starting in 1976, but has become particularly important in the last 10 or 15 years. And then of course, COVID-19. And the arrow that goes up suggests that there will be even more diseases in the future because this is part of of, of humankind. We, viruses and diseases are a given of mankind. So let's just divide diseases when we think about them into two major types. The first is a non-communicable disease. That is a disease that somebody cannot get from you directly. Diabetes is a non-communicable disease. Cancer is a non-communicable disease. But these are not the diseases that we are interested in in this seminar. What we're interested in are infectious diseases. For example, measles, chickenpox, influenza, cold, which can spread from person to person. And COVID-19 is, of course, the most major and important one currently for us. Infectious diseases, so if, if you, those of you who will remember will know that the, the foundation stone of our thinking about infectious diseases is that they're caused by some microorganism. It could be a bacterium, it could be a virus, it could be a parasite, it could be a fungus. There are multiple choices, but very, very largely, if you exclude diseases that are caused by the misfolding of proteins, for example, such as CJD, or or mad cow disease, all of the diseases, virtually every other disease, has has at its root a microorganism that causes it. The important microorganisms for us are bacteria and viruses. These move between humans, either directly or indirectly. The direct contact between people, for example, through a handshake or someone sneezing in front of you, that's one way in which you can transmit the disease between people. There are other ways, for example, for COVID-19, the droplet route by which someone sneezes or coughs or emits droplets while breathing, and somebody comes and breathes in those droplets into the respiratory system, and that sets off the disease. That is one way in which COVID-19 spreads between people through a respiratory route, through droplets. And this is, of course, very interesting because this points to how COVID-19 is able to be spread so fast. Because any sort of confined region, the droplets are suspended in air for something like at least about a few hours after someone has coughed or has emitted these droplets. And during that time, anyone can come and ingest them and take them in, which really points to why mask wearing is particularly important. A number of diseases come to us from animals, and these are called zoonotic diseases. Bats, poultry, other types of animals are from where these are really sourced. These are natural hosts for the viruses. So for them to move to a human being, an event must happen that is called a spillover event in which a virus that is adapted to living in an animal host 
acquire some changes, acquire some new adaptation that enable them to survive and multiply in a human host. So SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 are all examples of diseases that come to us, of zoonotic diseases that come to us from animals. This is particularly important because three out of every four new or emerging infectious diseases actually come to us from animals. And that points to the importance of understanding a lovely field called disease ecology. You work in a botany department, so you, you're all increasing, you're all aware of the importance of, of ecological ideas and ecological framing of these concepts. So the broad way of thinking about it, of human diseases in a larger context of ecology, of animal diseases, of veterinary diseases, of food safety and security, this is called One Health. And increasingly, human beings are coming to the understanding and scientists are coming to the understanding that to really understand human health and to be able to understand all of the threats that it might face, you have to think about One Health, which is a much larger picture where you consider the ecological health of the planet. So that's back to Spanish flu again. And am I going in the right direction? Yeah. And I just wanted to make the point that um, Gandhiji contacted Spanish flu. He was one of the people who got Spanish flu at that time. And both his daughter-in-law and her young son died of Spanish flu. The famous Hindi language writer and poet, Surakantra Party Nirala, as he was known, lost his wife and several members of his family to the flu. And here's a line in translation from his book. where He says, my family disappeared in the blink of an eye. All our sharecroppers and laborers died, the four who worked for my cousin, as well as the two who worked for me. My cousin's eldest son was 15 years old, my young daughter a year old. In every direction I turned, I saw darkness. And there's a lovely account in his book of you know, the, the, the river Ganga being filled with bodies that people had done because there was no wood enough to burn them. Um, here again, as I said, is, is, the, is the spread of diseases. And I want to remind you that it's our immune system that protects us from disease. And what it does is to gauge any prior contact with the virus or bacterium to help the immune system recognize any new invader that it encounters. What vaccinations do is really to prepare the immune system, to prime the immune system to do exactly this. So let's come to the basic question of how is knowledge about diseases and, and disease spread turned into the sort of mathematical models that help us predict their behavior. And that's what's going to be the focus of my talk with this background. The whole question of how diseases affect populations is called epidemiology, okay? De demos it means the people, epi means upon. So how do diseases upon people, what happens upon people in groups of people is really the question. And the field of, you can imagine a population that is some fraction of whom are in good health, some fraction of whom are in ill health. And the fraction of people in health is fluctuating from time to time. And that's what changes as time goes on. A very classic beginnings of epidemiology can be traced to this gentleman called John Snow in 1854, who did a detailed study of a cholera outbreak in London. He came from a humble beginning. He was the son of a coal yard laborer who later became a doctor. And he worked during the time of the cholera epidemic in 1849, 1848 to 1849 in London. And it was he who decided or traced the source of the cholera epidemic to contaminated water coming from water pumps. How he did it is very interesting. Here is a plot of what he really did. He took a map of London around which a bunch of cholera cases had been reported. And he put a little dot around every location where, of a case, in the house of every location where there was a case. He also marked on this map the locations of different pumps in the area. So pump A, pump B, pump C, pump D, et cetera, et cetera. And then just looking at it, he noticed that the cases were sort of clustered around the pumps Around, around one specific pump, in this case, the pump A or the Broad Street pump, as it called, because it lay on Broad Street. So he said that this cannot be by accident. There must be something to do with the pump. Maybe there is some problem with the water that is coming out of that pump. So he recommended to the city that they close down that pump and provide alternative water arrangements for everybody who lived there. And that was the point at which the cholera, cholera um, outbreak went away. And people realized that for the first time, that it is possible to think about the larger causes of the spreading of diseases, even with simple arguments such as this. The broad seed pump was decided, as he said, was a primary source of infection. If you'll notice, there are two blocks that you can see just below the words broad street on the map, which have no cases at all, even though people were living there. It turned out that these were people, or the people who lived in these houses had an alternative supply of water. And so they were not constrained, constrained to drink from pump A on Pond Broad Street. And the fact that they didn't have the water was an additional clue that this was a disease that spread through water. Remember that at this time, there was no knowledge of bacteria or viruses. So this is epidemiology that is, sits in a sense above that. 
and looks at how diseases can be transferred in the first place, even if you don't know what the microscopic causative agent that leads to that disease actually is. And I tell you a little bit of history about disease in India. So these, these cities, so, you know, close to you, close to me at the moment, Kasoli, Almora, and then further south, Mumbai, Kolkata, Bangalore, and Hyderabad as well, have a very special place in the history of models in epidemiology. So Ronald Ross, let's start the story with Ronald Ross, who lived between 1857 and 1932, and received the Nobel Prize in 1902 for the discovery of the life cycle of the malaria parasite. He was born in Almora, so that's where Almora comes in. He joined the Indian Medical Service in 1881. He worked in Bombay and Kolkata and Hyderabad as well. So that's where these cities are marked. While he was posted in Bangalore, he noted the connection between water and mosquito control. The stagnant water led to breeding of mosquitoes. And he thought that maybe mosquitoes had something to do with how the disease was being transmitted. In 1895, he saw the first stages of growth of the malaria parasite in the mosquito. And this led, of course, up to his Nobel Prize in 1902. But from the point of view of models for disease, which, I really, which is really my interest in what I want to tell you about, the most famous mathematical model for disease was developed by two scientists, one of whom had an Indian connection. So that's again the connection to the cities that I marked out earlier. This model was not recognized adequately for many years, but then later came into prominence. And in a sense, is the most important and most basic model that we think about when we think about how diseases move from person to person. This model is called the SIR model, and I want to tell you a little bit about the model. But let me tell you a little bit about the people who constructed it first. And these were two Scotsmen. One was called A.G. McKendrick, and the other was called W. O. Kermack. McKendrick was born in Scotland, joined, trained as a doctor, and then joined the Indian Medical Service, and was posted as the director of the Pasteur Institute in Kasoli. So that's why I marked Kasoli on that map. He returned to England in 1920 and became superintendent of the Royal College of Physicians Laboratory in Edinburgh between 1920 and 1941. Kermack is also a very interesting person. He was trained as a mathematician and then later became a chemist. But when he was working in a chemistry lab, he had this tragic accident that blinded him completely. As a chemist, it's very hard. It's impossible to work as a chemist on as a bench chemist if you don't have the use of your eyesight. So he went back to his mathematics training and began to think about how diseases moved between person and person. So Kermack and McKendrick worked together to develop mathematical models that Ross had begun to set up earlier in the context of mosquitoes and malaria and refine these models further. Here's an example of an application of what Kermack and McKendrick did. And this is an example, the points that you see to the right hand side illustrate the plague outbreak in Bombay in 1905. So each point is the number of people infected who landed up at hospitals in Bombay in a particular week. So the x-axis is the time in weeks, so starting at 0, 5, 10, 15. By about 32, 33 weeks, the epidemic had stopped altogether. So then the question was this rise in the suppression of the number of cases. What, where did it come from and what could we expect from it? So the outbreak was over effectively by week number 30 that is marked there. By then, a certain fraction of the population had already been infected with plague. And the job of a mathematical model is to try and understand graphs like this, understand data like this, and try to figure out what determines data like this. So Kermack and McKendrick went back and compared the data to the theoretical model. What I want to ask is, what were Kermack and McKendrick thinking about? What were these ideas that led to the formulation of these models for disease? And why does their work help us today understand diseases and how they spread a little better? So now I'm going to tell you about this model and I wanted to be just describe it at a very intuitive level, which is actually it's all that you need to understand what it is that they did. What they imagined was that you could take the, that an individual per, person could either be susceptible, infected or recovered with respect to the disease. So you could put each of them into one or the other of these boxes. There's a box or a compartment marked susceptible for susceptible individuals. There's a box or compartment marked infected for infected individuals. And there is a compartment called recovered for recovered individuals. So that's really the essence of, of the idea. So once each individual is assigned to a compartment, I can say there are a certain number of people in the susceptible compartment, a certain number in the infected compartment, and a certain number in the recovered compartment. And as someone gets infected from the susceptible compartment, I move them from susceptible to infected. As they recover, I move them from infected to recovered. So now I can imagine movements between these different compartments as a consequence of infection. So that's the, the lines along which Kermack and McKendrick were thinking. That if people get infected and then recover, you can think of this as a motion between these different compartments. 
So the next point is that susceptible people don't become infected on their own. They must come into contact with someone who's infected because this is an infectious disease that we're trying to model. So the contacts between infected and susceptible are crucial to driving infected people becoming, susceptible people becoming infected and infected people actually recovering, okay? So that is marked by this little arrow here, saying that infected people influence susceptible people and susceptible people as a consequence move to the infected compartment. So some contact between susceptible and infected people are required so that the disease can proceed and the numbers of people who are susceptible can decrease at the expense of numbers who are infected. The more the number of infected people, the more the number of susceptible people that they can infect. And this idea of contact is what really makes this model very interesting and, and difficult. Here are a set of equations that describe exactly what I told you in words in a mathematical model. These equations, you don't have to worry about them. All they do is to tell you about how the numbers of people in each of these compartments changes as a function of time. Skirmak and Mechanic took equations like that. They solved these equations and they showed that this could predict for you where you were relative to the epidemic spread. And you can see that these lines that they have drawn, this is from, from this paper by Kermack and McKendrick. The line that you can see that joins these, these sort of open circles is the result of a theoretical calculation. And you can see that the black dots there are the original data that I showed you about the progress of the epidemic. And you can see that the theory and the actual data regarding the number of infected people in every week actually fit each other fairly closely. Having now introduced you to what the ideas behind mathematical modeling of pandemics is, we can ask, what do we want to know? The first question that you might want to know is, if you have a few infected people initially, right in the beginning, will the disease spread further or will it die out? How many people will be infected at the end of this infection? What does vaccination do and how does vaccination actually help control the numbers of people who fall in with the disease? And how many people should you vaccinate in the first? Should you aim to vaccinate everybody? Or is it enough to vaccinate 50% or 60% of the people for the disease to die out? All of these answers depend upon one number. It's called the basic reproductive ratio. And that is a number that differs from disease to disease. The interpretation is a very simple one of this quantity. <clears throat> the interpretation is the number of people that one sick person will infect on average is exactly the basic reproductive ratio. Ebola, the number is two, swine flu, the number is two, HIV is four, measles is 18, which means that on average, one person who has measles, if you surround them by people who don't have measles, who are susceptible to, to contracting measles, then they will infect on average 18 people. So measles is a disease that spreads to a large number of people. It's a highly infectious disease. Whereas Ebola is not particularly infectious. It may be fatal, it is a fairly um, virulent disease. But on the other hand, it's relatively difficult to transmit Ebola from person to person, unless you use actual physical contact to transfer bodily fluids from one person to another. Measles is a respiratory disease, it's airborne. Therefore, it's easy to get it. Someone in a classroom who has measles can easily give it to every other child in that particular classroom. The way in which people become infected can be appreciated by thinking about the reproductive ratio. If one person affects two people, each of those two people affects four people, totally, and then each of those four people affects a further eight people, eight to 16, etc. This is the number that grows very rapidly. And if you remember this old story of the king and the wazir and the putting of one rice grain, two rice grains, four rice grains, eight rice grains, etc. on the squares of a, of, of a chessboard, you can see this is a number that is going to increase very rapidly. This is exponential growth. So by the time you reach the end of the chessboard, even though it looks very small, you're just adding one or two grains at a time in the beginning, this number can rapidly get very large and bankrupt the king completely. So let me tell you about how many people will be infected. The answers to some of those questions. How many people will be infected? The answer depends upon R0 or the reproductive ratio. The larger the reproductive ratio, the larger the, 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 larger the number of people who will be infected. Why should we vaccinate against the disease? The reason is by vaccinating susceptible people, you reduce the R0. But it's interesting that you don't have to vaccinate everybody. It's enough to vaccinate a certain critical number inside the population. This is called herd immunity. The fact that, that protecting a good fraction of the population effectively protects everybody else because it becomes much more difficult for someone who's infected to find somebody who is susceptible before they, before they recover themselves from the disease. And for Ebola, there is a simple mathematical relationship that we know about. For Ebola, it's enough to vaccinate 50% of the people because the R0 is true. For measles, you have to vaccinate 95% plus of people because R0 is so large, it's close to 18. So the larger the R0, 
the larger the fraction of people who must be vaccinated against the disease. Vaccinating sufficient numbers, not necessarily everyone in a population, yields, as I said, the term is herd immunity. And for COVID-19, when we want to vaccinate, we hope to be able to get to 60 to 70%, because that's roughly the threshold where we believe that herd immunity will begin to operate. These models can get rapidly very much more complicated and very much more detailed. This, I can have many more compartments. We thought of one simple S, I, and R compartment, just these three compartments. But you can make these individual compartments far more detailed. You can divide them into sub-compartments according to age. Because, for example, elderly people may have, may be, it may be more dangerous for them to contract the disease, whereas mild people may be infected, but they will not contract the disease in the sense they will not become symptomatic for the disease. And that's certainly something that we know for COVID-19. There's also vector-borne diseases of the type that originally Ross studied, where you have mosquitoes who are vectors for malaria, and they bite people and give them malaria. And later, some other mosquito who's uninfected comes, bites that person, bites somebody else, and transfers the malarial parasite from one person to another person indirectly. So that's an example of a vector-borne disease where the basic, where, where the, the entity that transfers from person to person is indirect, is an intermediate vector. We can talk about sexually transmitted diseases and the complexities of describing compartments in that. You could have a low risk population and a high risk population. So there would be two compartments which are alike in every respect, except that one has a lower risk of contracting a sexually transmitted disease, whereas the other has a higher risk. But we would use the same logical arguments to discuss that. We can input in spatial behavior. For example, the idea of a metapopulation is where I have a little SIR model here, one here, one here. Maybe this represents Delhi, this represents Bhatinda, this represents Amritsar, this represents Jalandhar, this represents Sonipat, etc. And each of these populations have people inside them, they contract the disease. But the movement of people between these metapopulations, they're called the populations together described as a better population. But the movements of people between these populations transfers disease from one to the other. So that's again important in India because once we opened up at the end of a long lockdown of COVID-19 that led to people going back, for example, from the cities back to the villages, the much more mobility in general. And this mobility also helped us trans to spread the disease from places which had not seen it before to new, to, 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 from, uh, from places which had seen large numbers of cases to places that had seen no cases at all. Let me discuss a little bit to show you why thinking about the reproductive ratio is important. I showed you some equations for that, and those equations had various Greek terms. One was a term called beta, one was a term called gamma. So it turns out that the reproductive ratio is, a ra is the ratio of beta to gamma, and it has following very interesting interpretation. It's a product of three things. The first thing is transmissibility. That is the probability of causing an infection in somebody else, if, if a susceptible person contacts that infectious person. So that is a property both of diseases. It's a property specifically of how the disease is transmitted between person to person. The second is the average rate of contact. How many times does a susceptible person contact an infectious person? Because the more the contacts the infectious person has with susceptible people, the more the likelihood is that that disease will be transmitted from infectious to susceptible. D is duration. How long does the person remain infectious? And the reason is that if you are contact a certain number of people for one day or for 10 days or for 100 days, you increase the rate at which you can possibly infect people. So the natural cutoff on that is how long you remain infectious. For, for SARS-CoV-2, which is COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19, you might be infectious for a period of about five to seven days. So that's a period in which you should reduce your contacts with other people. And all of these suggest how you might control the spread of epidemics. You can reduce transmissibility, which is the tau part of this equation, by developing vaccines. So if you immunize somebody, then they will not get the disease from other people, they will not give the disease to other people. Because the other thing is to use antiretrovirals, for example, for the AIDS, that prevent, that reduce the load of virus in your body, in your bloodstream, and thereby reduce the property, the, the probability that you will transmit it to someone else. Second is to decrease your mean contact, so that's a C bar. So isolating people, quarantining them, various health education programs that encourage social distancing, et cetera, as well as mask wearing, are all things that go into decreasing the mean contacts. So mask wearing also contributes to reducing the transmissibility because fewer viral particles are emitted. They're trapped by the mask that you're actually wearing. The D, the reducing the infectious period, the timing of the infectious period is by therapeutics, antibiotics in the case of bacterial diseases. All of these act to boost the innate immune response. And by doing that, you have reduced the amount of time by which someone remains infectious. So all of public health interventions for infectious diseases 
really use one or the other combination of these quantities with the ultimate aim being to reduce the reproductive ratio to a value below one where it just disease just stops spreading within the population a couple more ideas about diseases and how to think about them that are very different from the first idea the compartmental model that i described one is an idea of networks and the second is the idea of individual based or agent based models now networks if you will think about it the interaction of people with other people is really governed by a network i have a network at home i have a network at school i have a network at office and it's these people that i mainly interact with and who are most likely that i will transmit a disease to you could have emotional networks transactional networks contact networks social networks etc the one that we are interested in are the physical networks that describe the contacts between people that are capable of providing infections from one to the other so one can work on models such as these that really look at describing the networks that link people to to other people there's a lot of work on understanding the nature of such social networks what is the network of a school child so what is the network of a family man of a worker of an elderly person and one can put it into these models and simulate disease spread among people such as this in this model so one example tracking flu transmission where you can have a first flu case and then you can investigate how many people got infected by that person how many secondary cases were there how many tertiary cases there what what could have been done to prevent the spread and over here this is looking at transmission within a school and how the flu spread between the school and different households that the children came from and it it's an interesting fact that closing the school didn't spread the spread of the outbreak didn't stop the spread of the outbreak of flu because these children it really moved between children and children were meeting outside school to a network of friends individual based models can be changed with certain structure the network model that i described to you earlier into something called an agent based model an agent based model is probably the most detailed and most technically complete description of each of these individuals we initially thought of them as nodes of a network interacting with each other so everything you were connected to were the only people that you could interact with but with agent based models you can use complicated computational methods that make them more realistic you can put in the differences in ages difference in exposure difference in workplaces etc at a much more granular and small scale level than you could do with the network models so this is you know thinking about people as people their interactions here's one example of how you know we automatically react to the behavior of other people by moving backward or forward behaving in a particular way etc so this would be one way of thinking about nagin based model it really works at the level of individuals there are a bunch of such models we also work on such models these are very computer intensive and usually they bank on the idea of any of a synthetic population that is a computational population modeled on a computer that describes the details of the study population as carefully as possible and you can even put this on some sort of realistic background such as a geographical information system background such as the picture in the bottom that you can see it's also used these methods are also used in large scale you know in in videos in video games and videos and in movies as well to collect construct the illusion that there are lots of people actually moving forward doing various things so this is just an agent based model on that you can simulate the software by which you can do this and later upload that or so many of the big blockbuster movies for example the lord of the rings etc rely on technology such as this i want to finish up by telling you a little bit about the work that we ourselves have been doing i belong to an organization called the indian scientists response to covid-19 this is a voluntary organization with a website called isrc so look you can look up isrc on on, on google we have a bunch of reports out of the indian science response to covid-19 there's a smaller modeling group that has put out a bunch of reports ever since april of last year in looking at different aspects of the modeling of of covid-19 in india so we have projections for chennai for delhi etc cetera, etc cetera, which we studied and a lot of these are used to under for governments to understand what to do to control the disease how do we bring people back to work etc here's one example of what we could do so <clears throat> this is uh, our predictions for what might happen in terms of the number of cases that would require hospitalization in pune so this is for pune city and you can see that little band is a band we suggested that cases should remain within during the period of this pandemic and you can see that much of the data really stayed exactly never went significantly beyond that little bound that we had showed we have work also on looking at mumbai and you can see the sort of peaks and the troughs of mumbai in number of cases etc both we can look at the number of daily deaths and daily infected and try to understand what was it that happened at these specific times that led to a certain type of behavior in these cities and what might happen in the future which is really the point of doing predictive modeling 
So let me finish with that. And I think that's all I had to say. But let me revise what I told you. What I did was to give you a very, very quick introduction into a lot of terminology and background of infectious disease. And although it may not have seemed like that, you now know a whole lot of the terminology and words that are required in the future for you to be able to pick up an article, let's say, or even a, a sort of an introductory book about diseases and epidemiology to understand what these terms actually mean. We studied the background, I told you a little bit about the background with a particular example, the example of MERS in South Korea and how it spread. I talked about the history of infectious diseases and what pandemics were and where they came from. Then I described compartmental models, the simple model, the SIR model that Kermack and Kendrick wrote down. He discussed the reproductive ratio and the idea of herd immunity. I spoke about better populations, more complicated models, all of this we described during the course of what we said. Then I told you a little bit about the logic of public health measures. What are the different terms that go into the calculation of the reproductive ratio and how fiddling with each one of them so prescribes a certain set of measures that you can do. You can target your work into which you think might be most fruitful, whether it's most fruitful to reduce the viral load of people who've been already infected, whether it's more fruitful to reduce the contacts between people so that they don't infect each other. All of these have to be decided in the framework of specific diseases. I told you about different models. We added complexity to that description. I spoke about network models. I spoke about agent-based models. And I also spoke about a somewhat more complicated models that we had been working on to describe COVID-19 in India. So with all of that, let me just say thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions that you might have and let me stop sharing at this point. Yeah, thanks a lot, Professor Gautam. It was a really nice introduction, a very basic and a thorough introduction to uh, various terms that we use in disease uh, modeling, the disease epidemiology. And uh, you have introduced so many interesting concepts, uh, especially uh, yeah, the the, re the basic reproductive ratio R zero and why that that one term itself is very much important, uh, especially for uh, comparing between different kinds of diseases, you know, infectious diseases and how how severity, uh, how transmissible a particular infectious disease is. Many of them, uh, even even today, many people, especially in the, so the social media, you can see that people are comparing the COVID-19 with uh, a simple flu. So, I mean, the, the case is very different, right? If you look at that uh, basic reproductive ratio. And yes, you, uh, I really enjoyed when you speak about the, the MERS and spillover event, because even established academicians resort to the conspiracy theories and hawks. Uh, you know, to say about the origin of this disease. I really enjoyed your, the, the discussion, but uh, yeah, um, um, I really want to know what the students are, uh, uh, you know, it's open for discussion. Any students, please unmute and ask the question directly instead of this uh, chat box. Please unmute and ask the question. Good evening, sir. Good evening, Asima. Um, uh, sir, my question is, uh, does herd of immunity works for COVID-19? and the, it, can it be achieved by uh, partial vaccination? So for any infectious disease, herd immunity will work, provided that, the, that you have immunity that lasts for some amount of time. If your immunity is completely temporary for only a few months, then the idea of herd immunity does not become useful anymore. The longer the herd immunity lasts, the longer the immunity that you get, either from infection or from vaccination lasts, the more sensible the concept of herd immunity actually is. The original idea of herd immunity is immunity through vaccinations, not through disease. But now occasionally people also mention that even if you contract COVID-19 and then recover, in a sense, you are immune for some period, at least as far as we know, maybe six months to a year. So that along with vaccinations together might get you to herd immunity somewhat faster than only vaccinations might. Because already now in India, we can say maybe 30% of people have already been infected. So anything more that we can do to that, especially for vulnerable people in the society who have not been infected so far, will help us move towards that herd immunity threshold, which is probably somewhere around 60 to 70% would be our best guess at this point. Thank you, sir. Sir, another question is, sir, you discussed about the, def uh, the definition of infectious disease. The disease is caused by microorganisms like fu uh, fungus, uh, bacteria, and viruses. But can we say prion disease as an in, as an infectious disease? It is, because prion diseases, you can also, you can, you can add a prion, this folded prion protein into somebody and they will, they, and they will contact the disease. That's what happened with the BSC, the bovine sponge and bovine spongiform encephalopathy or mad cow disease. 
which is also, it turns out to be related to something called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in human beings. So these originate in misfolded protein and that disease was transferred to human beings because people had infected beef in which, which of the beef from, derived from animals that, had, that already had mad cow disease. So that's one example, certainly one misfolded protein ingesting it from an external source is a way of transferring the disease from one person to another. So it is as infectious. We don't think about it because it's a somewhat unusual disease. And certainly viral and bacterial diseases are much more important to human health than those diseases. But it's important, they fall under the same category of infectious diseases. And yes, that discussion has become much more complicated when we talk about the microbiome. So can we actually exchange a microbiome by just by talking? And a lot of interest about the microbiome these days, even with the depression and diabetes and very complicated. Uh, yes. Um, you know, while uh, Asima was asking this question, I was thinking about uh, the botany. They are, we are basically botanists. And plant pathology, is there any special models for uh, plant pathology? Are you aware of any... So that's not a field that I work in. I know that people have worked on some agent-based models for, for, for plant diseases. And I guess many of these ideas should also hold there. I don't, th I don't think there's anything that says that plants are completely different. You should think about them theoretically completely differently. But maybe it's not a field that I know. So maybe I shouldn't say too much about it until I, I read up more and I'm able to answer that. Okay, so the, uh, coming to the model, of course, uh, you know, the uh, probably the most day-to-day uh, -day life, the model, the mathematical models used is on uh, the climate, I mean, the weather prediction, you know, the, yeah, the, the TV broadcasters, they, they are picking up from the IMD. And is there any similarity with this kind of models and the mathematical models that you are using? Is there any basic similarity? Is it based on the regression? No, so the weather models are usually of, of two broad types. One is purely statistical, that because you have a whole sort of history of statistical data that says that you know, under these conditions, so the IMD model, I think, has 13 or 20 variables that they use to prescribe what is going to happen to monsoon in this year or not. The other things are much more detailed global climate models or, or that are weather prediction models that are hugely computationally intensive. And they are much more sort of engineering models. They model the flow of model evaporation. They model cloud formation. They model the flows of air, et cetera, et cetera. So those, because in those models, it's very clear what you should be modeling. And whereas in epidemiological models, you have to make a choice as to what scale you want to model. Do you want to model the individual? Do you want to model groups of individuals? Do you want to model entire populations? Do you want to think of everybody as just one different compartment? All of these choices and flexibility exist when we think about epidemiology because it's just so difficult. In climate prediction, we believe we know what the basic variables are, which is why we believe we can understand climate change, we can predict the consequences of climate change. With diseases, it's impossible to do that. And it's really, you know, it is very much a question of what, how you choose to model, at what granularity you choose to model. And finally, the spread of diseases has a lot to do with human behavior, it has almost everything to do with human behavior. So predicting human behavior is, of course, the hardest thing on earth. So a model, can you say the model as a, an equation? So the, I wrote down a set of equations. So that describes the SIR model that Kermack and McKendrick wrote down. I told you about the model in words because that's all I wanted to do. But if, but if there had this been a more mathematical discussion, I would have shown you how those equations that I wrote down came from the words that I used to describe it. But you don't need to understand the equations in order to understand the description of how they got to this idea. And those equations you can run on a computer or you can do, use the internet to figure out what those solutions should be. So when I talk about a model, I mean either equations of that sort, or I mean a computational model, if I, which is the case where I cannot write down equations. I really have to simulate. I simulate people interacting with each other on a computer and then ask, what does that mean for disease spread? Any other questions from the students? Please unmute and ask. I can see some of the questions, but you may please ask it. Thank you, sir. And sir, you talked about this uh, re reproduction rate. Sir, this is very much related with the, this fatality rate. Uh, once the, which, uh, in which disease, we, when the uh, reproductive rate is less, uh, it is very fatal. No, it doesn't. It, no, it doesn't relate to fatality at all. And um, it, for example, flu. The reproductive ratio might be somewhere between two and three. Flu is not generally considered a fatal disease. 
is it, except for if you're elderly or if you have a severely compromised immune system the reproductive yeah. ratio just refers to how how to how many people does it spread and uh, that's how, and therefore how fast does it grow do the numbers of infected people grow the smaller the reproductive ratio is the slower it grows the larger it is the faster it grows it doesn't have to do anything about the seriousness of the disease or the the virulence of the disease thank you sir next hello mm. go ahead asima sir can we can we use blockchain concept like bitcoin to trace disease spread i don't know i mean i'm sure there are lots of computational techniques that one can use to do what is called contact tracing where if there's one in fact if i tell you that so many people have been infected can you go back and figure out where that infection started where did that person acquire it from and how does it spread so there are different computational techniques blockchain i don't know i, I thought that's a sort of more a cryptography and security uh, way i don't think it's directly applicable here but i don't know it's possible that it might be mahima could you please unmute and ask the your question mahima mohanto yes sir uh, uh, sir uh, while we were studying uh, bio statistics and we uh, saw that uh, statistics while uh, being uh, true to itself like it's very objective and cannot be changed but uh, uh, the way we word uh, the statistics the way we put out uh, the numbers in the world it can be manipulated very uh, uh, differently and very uh, greatly so how can we uh, prevent uh, the propagandization in a way uh, of the statistics and the numbers so one thing to do is for you as students to be more uh, skeptical about the numbers that you see to ask to, to first be train yourself quantitatively to understand what these numbers are and what they represent the other is to go to trusted sources for example the world health organization or in your the european uh, cdc or the us cdc etc who will tell you give you the numbers and tell you how they extracted their conclusions from those numbers so they will explain those statistics in detail and then you can say does it make sense to me does it not are they fiddling with it what do i know so you should so both of these things as a good citizen you should be aware of of if you have certain numerical literacy to make sure that you understand what is being said and that no one tries to fool you and the second is you should go to sources that are trusted because scientists who trust them believe in those numbers and know that they are to be believed and the reputation of people relies on the fact that these are believable numbers so adding on to it the mathematical model uh, we have two very famous model uh, i mean from the media which i came across is one is the mit uh, which they uh, you know this uh, it was way back in july 2020 uh, which they put in a pre publication i'm not sure it did it did they able to publish that finding which they predicted that it will cross almost uh, approximately 3 lakh cases per day uh, covid 19 infection by the end of 2021 Uh, by a very famous MIT team, and on the other side of the coin, we have a model by the so-called India su- uh, Super Matrix, right? A super model, uh, right? So national super model by ICMR. So I mean, yes. So that question is kind of very. Uh, I mean, it's very tricky, right? Which model to go with? So rational choice is also very, uh, yeah. And also another uh, doubt I'm having is that uh, you know more parameter. Does it actually makes the model better? the more complicated model might not be the best model maybe simple model could be very good isn't it what is i your... agree i agree but there's a trade off between what you might want to ask and the complex so it should be just as complex as you need but no more complex ah. even with these models you might want to ask different questions how many people will die how many people will go to the icu how many people will be asymptomatically infected so all of these require specifying some number of things so if you ask very very simple questions then simple models will do the more complicated your questions for spatial dependence how is it spreading out from the center of the city after the first few cases this requires much more complicated you know guesses for what might be happening statistical work to figure out what the parameters are so it's very much a question of what you think you would like to extract from the model and going back to your earlier comment about models it's essential that models be transparent so that people can critique them 
people can say you should not believe this model because of this reason this reason this reason or this model doesn't work because you predicted this and that did not happen in fact you were very wrong so that it is important when people discuss models or tell you about models that they're very transparent about what goes into the model and how it's constructed then people with regular common sense or even an expert can then critique it publicly and say one should not believe the model for this and this and this reason yeah you have, you have gone to the you know the 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 basic of how the science works by criticism and open for you know uh, open for a feedback loop so all this scientific method uh, uh, let it be the case of a model or the vaccine you know unless you show the proof that it works then how can you believe it there is no belief in science that is what i heard recently uh, you know the science is only about facts isn't it uh, yeah. it's immaterial you believe the vaccine works or not So yeah, it any works, it works whether you believe it or not. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, any other questions from the students? Please unmute and ask the question. Sita. Yes, sir. My question was: What is the infection fatality rate IFR and how to calculate it? And Mohabbat's question was quite. Uh, so that's, a, that's, that's a very difficult question. The infection fatality um, ratio is probably the most important feature of a disease that can cause death, that can lead to death. And right now, we know that it depends upon many things. It depends upon how old you are. The older you are, the more likely you are that you will die of COVID nineteen. If you have pre-existing conditions, the likelihood that you will that those will together act to give you a more unfavorable outcome than for people who don't have those conditions. For younger people, it's almost very very likely that they will not have a severe case of COVID nineteen. Although it's not, although some small fraction of people will. So when you talk about IFR, it's important to understand that even though you see just one number. it actually depends upon how ages are distributed within the population what is the distribution of ages within the population that can make a huge difference between european populations and indian populations right now the best bet for india's ifr is probably age average ifr is that it may be somewhere between 0.3 to 0.2 0.1 to 0.3 and there's a lot of uncertainty because we don't know whether we're counting deaths accurately we don't know whether the cases counting by of, of even through these um, the sero service is being done correctly we have no current information most of our information is old information and i think these uncertainties are very large so all we can do is to try and see what is it like in the us what is it like in brazil what is it like in mexico and then try and argue that india may not be very different from that and then see maybe it is maybe it isn't what are the reasons why it might be or not might be and right now the, what i would personally tend to is that i don't think it's very different from the ifr that is there in the west or in other parts of the world and it's probably really a consequence of the undercounting of deaths and of cases that we that we have numbers that we think are much smaller that people have suggested are much smaller yeah very good uh, yes uh, i think we can conclude uh, it's already the time and thanks a lot sir it is a fantastic uh, time that you spent with us it was really uh, you know we we come to know a lot of new terms and yeah, you threw the light on how the especially on the covid 19 and how it it spreads and the very basics of the uh, the modeling and before leaving i just yeah, i asked you about that uh, chennai uh, you know musical academy and uh, what was your involvement in it? and how the music academy is involved with the science communication that's a nice question so some years ago starting in 2015 a colleague of mine in sort of thought we should have a science program that was intended for the general public and we thought that the usual mistake that our institutions make is to have it inside our institutes inside our department inside our university but much of the public is not very comfortable in necessarily going there they have no you know it's the first time someone to step into an iit campus or a madras university campus or go into a go into a, a lecture hall inside there they don't know what it's like they feel a little bit intimidated so we thought we would change the venue completely to a venue that is where people are used to seeing completely non science things For example, the Madras Music Academy that everybody knows. So it's a very important venue. It's a very visible venue, and it's easy to get to because it's right in the center of town. So the idea was to have lectures on science for members of the general public, and we would do this once a year. So we did exactly that. In fact, it's been going on for the last four years since we started in 2017, 18, 19, and then the pandemic took over. And this is attended by around a thousand people every year. So all the ages from about you know eight or ten years old right up to eighty year old who come to this thing. 
We usually choose mid-career scientists, somewhere between about 40 to 50, and equal numbers typically of both women and men scientists who talk about their own work, but try to explain it to the public. So that's we think that it's important that that you know yeah, that people, the general public, should understand that the work that goes on in India, the quality of the work, and see sense a little bit of the excitement that these people have in talking about their own work. So that was the idea, and I think it's been very successful. It's one of the very unique programs of that sort in the country. Yeah, very nice to hear about this. Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting perspective. A music academy is into the science communication. I'm sure that, uh, you know, the, the, the first batch of the scientists who could able to convince the academy organizers to, to have the science program, uh, you know, much appreciation to those uh, scientists, yes. And today is also apparently a, a very important day, the UN Zero Discrimination Day. Do you have any saying about that? Because I was looking at a poster, a beautiful poster, and it says that, you know, the virus do not discriminate. You know, it is actually, we are the one discriminating all this. Viruses don't discriminate and neither should we. There is a poster by World Health Organization. So there is a lot of stigma associated with the, you know, positivity, uh, be it any kind of infection, especially with uh, uh, HIV AIDS or, uh, you know, this, this particular disease, the COVID-19. Isn't it? What is your, any, any, any message? I, I agree. I agree. I think any scientist, the advantage of, know, of being trained as a scientist is that we know that, that at any fundamental level, whether it's the elements that make up your body, whether it's the DNA that makes up your body, there is actually, the differences between people are almost completely negligible. It, 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 between the, the DNA of a Brahmin in a scheduled caste or between the DNA of, a, of an African or a European or a South, a South African. Or, the real the differences are so completely minor or almost non-existent. It would be hard, you would be hard put to find a difference between them. There would often be more differences between, say, two Indians than between an Indian and someone, say, from the Middle East or from someone from China. So as scientists, we know this. We know that it makes no sense to talk about to be to discriminate between people on the on the belief that they come from different backgrounds or they look different, etc. Ultimately, we're all the same. We're all made of the same set of elements. We all obey the same set of biological and physical laws. There's really no difference. So it's, for a scientist, it's completely natural to think of no discrimination. And that's the impression that we should, that's what we should tell the public. Yeah. Very nice, sir. Absolutely great uh, wisdom that, you know, the piece of wisdom which you, which you shared. Yes, nationalism. Again, you know, uh, ultimately it all boils down to that we are human beings, isn't it? So I remember there is a court, I forgot that the court exactly, but the court says like, I think it was uh, uh, Plato. Uh, he was quoted saying that somebody asked him, what, was you, what is your nationality? He said that um, I'm neither Greek uh, nor Roman. Uh, but I'm a citizen of the world, <laughs> you yes, know, that exactly. kind of. Exactly, yes. exactly, yes. exactly. All right, thank you so much for spending uh, this uh, beautiful evening with us, uh, almost one hour. And thank you, sir, uh, from bottom of our heart. And yes, thank all you of you, please me. take care. Let me th thank all of the students for their attention and for their very good questions. And thank you, Felix, yes. for organizing this. Goodbye. Thank you. Please take care. And if you can take care of someone else too, and goodbye.